welcome everybody to a very special Lunch and Learn as we commemorate the 90th anniversary of the 1929 uh, stock market crash and then the monumental Great Depression that followed. Uh, today we're fortunate to hear from Ralph Blumenthal, who had an incredible 45-year career at the New York Times as a foreign correspondent, a national bureau chief, metro correspondent, arts and culture reporter, and most importantly, as an investigative and crime reporter. His assignments included being the Saigon correspondent from late 1969 until early 1971 as the Vietnam War was raging. Uh, his journalistic beginnings can be traced all the way back to CCNY, uh, where he was the editor of the student newspaper before starting at the very bottom of the New York Times as a copy boy and then rising through the ranks. He has five books to his credit and many awards and accolades and shares his wisdom at Baruch College, uh, where he is a distinguished lecturer in its department of journalism and the writings professions. Now, when looking at the myriad of events uh, that Ralph uh, has covered, many of them about either the mafia and crime or police operations and war, you quickly uh, realize that Ralph must have a lot of both uh, physical and mental courage and toughness. And his topic today is about a time when our nation was facing a lot of problems and many individuals needed those same qualities as they were under tremendous economic pressure. So Ralph's gonna now turn back the clock for us to see how when money was scarce, when the banks were closed, what was the response? It is my pleasure to introduce Ralph Lumenthal. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all for coming. Um, thanks, of course, to the museum's Kristen, Kristen Aguilera, uh, founder John Herzog, who set this up. I'm joined here today by the director of our archives at Baruch, Sandra Roth, and her husband, Ken, um, and my wife, Deborah. I understand there's a class from Mexico here, so welcome to you. Um, I'm eager to learn what you might have to contribute at the end. Um, and thanks, of course, to my colleague, Sarah, um, Rappo at Baruch who helped set up the PowerPoint. So let me start by painting the picture. We're in a very historic part of New York. Exactly 90 years ago today, October 29, 1929, also Tuesday, known as Black Tuesday for reasons that will become obvious, uh, Wall Street was thick with milling crowds, giving off an ominous roar. Uh, the air was electric with panic. The market opened in free fall. Unpro unprocessed sale orders filled waste baskets. Ashtrays were full of half-smoked cigarettes. People lit up, not realizing that there were one or two already going. A record 16 and a half million shares were traded, almost four million than the previous record set for trading days earlier. <clears throat> it was a one-day loss of value in today's dollars in today's dollars, of nearly $208 billion, although that doesn't really convey the devastating impact. And the next day's New York Times front page is on the front. You may not be able to see it, but you can see the uh, big scare headline on the right side of the big stock plunge. You'll note also from the headline that bankers and brokers expressed optimism. <clears throat> but the crash was a process, not a one-day event, that set off the Great Depression with its emergency local currency, which I'll be talking about, called SCRIP. A SCRIP is defined as a provisional certificate of money, may be derived from subscription receipt, or an old French word for purse, escrop. And I'll be getting to that. That's an image of SCRIP we'll be talking about. Uh, now let me read you something that appeared in the New York Times. Wall Street's bull market collapsed with a detonation heard round the world. Hundreds of small traders were wiped out. The sales were countrywide. Now, surprisingly, the date of that report was June 13th, 1928. That is almost a year and a half before Black Tuesday. The market had hiccuped and then recovered. In fact, the crash began as a succession of wild swings that turned precipitously down, negative, on Thursday, October 24th, 1929, 
when panic sellers sold off nearly 13 million shares, sending the Dow down 11%. Now, stocks made a recovery, as they often did and do, but the following Monday, they were sharply down again, and the next day, Black Tuesday, the bottom fell out. The four days of trading had cost investors $30 billion. In today's money, that would be nearly half a trillion, and almost 10 times more than the entire 1929 federal budget, to give you some perspective. <clears throat> By November 1929, the equivalent of $1.5 trillion had disappeared from the economy. By the summer of 1932, the Dow was down to almost 41, having lost 90% of its value. By 1933, nearly 13 million Americans, almost a quarter of the workforce, were jobless. Now, Wall Street had seen plenty of trouble before, notably the Panic of 1907 and the 1920 bombing outside J.P. Morgan and Company, right across the street, that killed 38 people and injured more than 300. But those disasters came and went. The crash of 29 was different. It seemed prolonged prolonged and endless and nearly took the country down with it. Now, for some perspective, by the way, uh, some of you might have been here last year when my good uh, colleague and friend at the New York Times, Diana Enriquez, spoke about the crash of 1987. Uh, that was known as Black Monday. Everything is black. Uh, October 19th, 1987. So that's 32 years ago. And I don't know what it is with October. <laughs> uh, which is not over yet. Uh, that day, um, in, in 1987, the Dow plummeted 22.5%, down twice as much as Black Tuesday. But the 1987 event, triggered in part by computerized selling, which we have now corrected, um, was far more easily overcome thanks to the Fed's quick and decisive injections, massive injections of liquidity and a stronger overall economy to begin with. So we don't have commemorations so much of 1987 as we do of 1929. In, rea in reality, there were many market ups and downs before and after the 1929 crash. Even after the shock of Black Tuesday, the plunge of prices halted by spring of 1930, and in April, the Dow was 50% above its November lows. In, in June 1930, President Herbert Hoover told a delegation of, vis of visiting clergy who were very worried about conditions, you have come 60 days too late. The depression is over, 1930. Of course, it was only beginning. So let's look at some pictures. So that's the trading floor. Um, they're looking at the ticker tape in the above right, and that's brokers sleeping in their offices because things were moving so fast that they didn't even dare to go home. Um, that $100 for the car today would be about $1,500, still pretty good for a luxury car. And you get some idea of the um, crowded Wall Street streets, of people thronging the streets, uh, and there's some of the coverage. Now, the high, point, the high point of the market was early September 1929 when the Dow, and remember, the Dow had been an index of only 12 stocks until 1928, uh, and, and then it was widened to the current 30 stocks. The Dow hit a record 381, up sixfold since 1921. So in eight years, the market shut up six times, sixfold. But the warning signs were soon evident. By late October, the index was down 20% because, as John Kenneth Galbraith, the great economist, reminds us, the stock market is only a mirror of the underlying economy. Now, the roots of the 1929 disaster were very deep. There had been a recession after World War I, and inventories built up during the war failed to find a market overseas, leading to a drop in exports. Farm prices were particularly hard hit, uh, in ravaged Europe, conditions were far worse. Uh, defeated Germany suffered a ruinous inflation that paved the way for Hitler. Um, and in the US, um, however, the problems were kind of hard to see behind what became known after the death of Warren Harding 
as the Coolidge boom, the Coolidge boom. It was fueled by several things. The Federal Reserve System, created in 1913 in reaction to the Panic of 1907, um, began reducing its discount rate from 7% in 1921 to 3% by 1924. So when the Fed does that, it makes, obviously, for easier credit. Uh, the automobile industry was surging. It was the uh, Silicon Valley of its time. Between 1921 and 1923, factory sales of passenger cars more than doubled in that short time to 3.6 million. Popular new mass entertainments of radio and movies were intoxicating. Talkies had come, uh, had started. A sexual revolution was underway. And of course, speaking of intoxicating, notwithstanding prohibition, um, liquid happiness flowed from every bootlegger's tap and speakeasy. <clears throat> so there's prohibition. Uh, he's, he's drinking out of the, the keg and the store club, I wrote a book about the store club, it was a very popular, uh, it began as a speakeasy, it became a very um, fancy mecca of high society. But despite all this glitter on the surface, deep problems lurked beneath. From 1920 to 1921, farm prices dropped by half. Through the 1920s, a third of wage earners earned less than $2,000 a year, but you have to transfer everything, obviously, to current value, so that would be $27,000 in today's money. That would qualify a family of three for poverty. Um, that would be the poverty level. So today the poverty level is about, the poverty rate is about 12%. So in the 20s, uh, almost three times more Americans lived in poverty at or below the poverty line than today. Interesting to know. Even before the crash, two banks a day were failing. And of course there was as yet almost no safety net. There was no federal deposit insurance corporation that insured your bank deposits, no social security, no unemployment insurance, no food stamps or Medicare. <clears throat> Another warning sign was the stock bubble. J.P. Morgan was supposedly once asked what the market was going to do, and he answered, it will fluctuate. That story seems to have come out about 20 years after Morgan died in 1913, so it may be suspect, like many other quotes that people keep repeating. But Americans weren't paying attention anyway. As the 1920s roared, uh, everyone seemed to fancy himself or herself a would-be millionaire, thanks to stocks that seemed to be growing up to the sky. It was increasingly easy to invest. Brokers opened margin accounts with a, as little as 10% cash down, which was great as long as stocks kept going up. The Fed was no help. It actually made borrowing easier. In, in August 1927, it lowered the discount rate from 4 to 3.5%, making credit even more available. The renowned financial writer John Brooks said, I love this image, it was like the police issuing guns to people on the street in a time of threatened riot. <clears throat> Brooks wrote an insightful book on the crash. It was named for a city in India where myth had it, everyone who passed through got rich. That's the book with a nice 1960s vibe. Um, in 1927 alone, brokers' loans to customers rose from what would be in today's dollars, 47 billion to 65 billion. But while the eastern seaboard surfed the wave, farmers and other suffering rural folk looked on askance, scandalized and seething, in case that sounds familiar today. <clears throat> it was not a universal thing throughout the country. There were pockets, and the East Coast was uh, really a, a place apart. <clears throat> in 1928, the Fed finally hit the brakes, raising the discount rate to 5%, but it was too little too late. With spectacular stock fortune, fortunes to be made, who cared about a slight rise in the cost of borrowing? Bankers loved it, borrowing from the Fed at 5% and loaning it at 12%. John Brooks put it well, bankers made money by existing. The Fed pleaded with bankers not to lend funds for speculation as far as possible. Now, how pathetic was that? But any attempt to have the government step in to halt the madness was denounced as interference. Flannel-throated fanatics in Congress 
oppressing an innocent Wall Street community. By the summer of 1929, Wall Street was in mayhem. Vacations were on hold as bankers and customers thronged the brokerages, glued to the ticker tape. Barbers and chauffeurs eavesdropped for stock tips and feverishly passed them on. But beyond the rising Dow, out of sight, many other stocks were down off their 1928 highs. It escaped notice. One of the shrewdest Wall Street operators was Joseph P. Kennedy, father of the, of the future president, who before the crash took his profits from investments and his vast holdings in Hollywood film studios and decamped for Palm Beach, saying wisely, only a fool holds out for top dollar. Now Joe Kennedy's biographer, David Nassau, says there's no evidence for the popular story that Kennedy decided it was time to get out of the market when he was getting his shoes shined and, and the shoe shine man gave him a stock tip. Everybody knows that story, but apparently it's wrong. Uh, nevertheless, with exquisite timing, Kennedy wisely cashed in and invested in real estate, amassing a fortune that would be equal today to about $3 billion. So he did have money for his son's political careers. <clears throat> and then in early September 1929, a broker by the name of Roger Babson in Wellesley, Massachusetts, spooked the market on a slow news day by mentioning in a luncheon talk what he had said many times before, sooner or later a crash is coming and it will be terrible. It may be terrific. <clears throat> a few days later, a big British financier, Clarence Hatchery, went bust. He later went to prison for fraud. And in October, regulators blocked Boston Edison from splitting its stock four to one and put the utility under a cloud by announcing an investigation. Now, none of these things by themselves seemed causative, but they cast a pall, shaking confidence in the market. <clears throat> Monday, October 21st, 1929, was a very bad down day with the third greatest sales in history. The ticker ran way behind, but then again, as it does, stocks rallied at the end, recovering some ground. Wednesday, October 23rd, was another bad day. On Thursday, October, October 24th, 1929, it turned into a rout. Crowds thronged Wall Street and a weird roar echoed through the canyon, drawing the police. Rumors of suicides abounded. Actually, there was a story that a worker went up on a building to do some repairs and a crowd gathered around expecting he would jump. <coughs> he would jump. 